This morning I'm feeling a little bit nervous because in about five minutes time, we are gonna interview one of the greatest naturalists of our time, Dr. Jane Goodall. One of the big problems that we face today is the number of people who have no connection with the natural world. This connection with the natural world is really important because people need to know we are part of the natural world. We actually aren't separated from it. In this leg of my journey, I'm hoping to get a better understanding of the amazing ways nature draws down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, reducing our impact on climate change. Why is nature one of our greatest allies in the fight against climate change? One of our main ways of fighting climate change is to protect our environment. And in particular, our forests and our oceans, the two great lungs of the world, which absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and the trees store it in their leaves and their roots, their trunks, and in the forest soil and the oceans store it in the kelp forest and the seagrass. And of course, there are other environments. The peatlands, they all store carbon dioxide. The heart of Jane's work around the world has been advocating for the people who live in an area to be in charge of its restoration and protection. It sounds obvious, but it's all too often not the case. Yet on my journey, wherever the local community benefits from the nature nearby, and is in charge of looking after it, the impacts are incredible. I'm heading back to mainland Scotland, and I'm about to have everything I thought I knew about nature and climate change turned on its head. never seen anything like that in my life before. The speed at which it's picking up those trees and cutting them into pieces is actually mind-blowing. It's like man versus nature, but like times 100. OK, so just two episodes ago, I was planting trees to tackle climate change. Now this. Believe it or not, this machine is chopping down forests in order to fight climate change. These aren't native forests, they're plantations. In the 70s and 80s, this landscape, known as peatland or peat bog, was seen as wastelands. So it was drained, dug up, and tree crops were planted. But we now know peat bogs are far from wastelands. They are carbon-storing wonder worlds. Peatland only covers 3% of the land on Earth, but it stores about 25% of global soil carbon. So it might be boggy and wet, and a little bit bleak, but this is as vital as any rainforest. So we cut down trees to save the climate. Mad, but brilliant. I'm heading to meet Paul, who's running this project with a team of local volunteers. I'm stuck in a bog, and I really genuinely can't get out. How do I get out? You gotta lie down or forward. <laughs> 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 yes! <laughs> it's just another day filming in Scotland, isn't it? It's these cool, wet conditions that make this the perfect environment for nurturing the carbon sponge. Paul and his team are here to check how deep it goes. Hey, guys. Right, hey. how are you doing? Lovely weather. Beautiful Scottish weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we'll just get to this out to, to get an idea of, of how deep four metres actually is. Yeah, I'd love to have a look. Yeah. So oh, that... <laughs> oh my God. So that's literally thousands of years worth of, of peat. It's not a glamorous landscape, is it? But it's incredibly important. Why is it so important now, almost more than it ever has been before? 
it always has been important, but people haven't really sort of recognised it. You're right, it is a difficult landscape to sell to people. Um, people are, are used to woodland, they're used to forestry, whereas this sort of open landscape, people either like it or they don't. It's growing on me. Once you realise this unassuming patch of land is ancient and has evolved to be like this, you start to notice the details, appreciate a bit of its magic. The good thing about storage of carbon in peatlands is that as long as you've got a healthy bog, it just keeps doing it on and on and on, constantly every year laying down a new layer of, 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 of peat and therefore locking that carbon up there. In nearly every environment on Earth, nature, if left to its own devices, will draw down carbon from the atmosphere. Six and a half thousand miles away from the peat bog in a much sunnier climate, another ecosystem is doing exactly the same job in a very different way. Experts have found that some oceans store more carbon than the land, especially near the coast. I reached out to marine scientist Tando from Cape Town, where the kelp she studies is the unsung hero of the sea. My name is Tando Mazomba. I'm 26 years old and I'm from the Eastern Cape, South Africa. Oceans provides us with so many gifts. The first one being that every two breaths we take out of three, those come from the oceans. We live because the ocean is thriving and it's able to give us these breaths. As a freediver, Tando needs just one of those breaths to explore the kelp forests. are pure magic. The colors that come through, the greens, the blues, the browns, it's just, it's a painting, it's a moving painting. And it's not just pretty. Kelp draws down carbon from the atmosphere at an incredible rate. Kelp is one of the fastest growing algae. The ones that we have in South Africa can grow about one centimeter a day, but around the world you can get kelp that grow to 60 centimeters a day if the conditions are right. They do take out massive amounts of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and this helps us regulate our climate. And they do this through a process called photosynthesis. When kelp dies, part of it floats off and sinks into the deep ocean, locking away carbon and keeping it out of the Earth's atmosphere. Protecting our marine coastal ecosystems means life for us as human beings. Kelp thrive in cold, nutrient-rich waters, and so it becomes worrying when we are facing ocean temperatures that are rising, because that is a direct threat to these ecosystems. The incredible value of these kelp forests is often not recognized or understood. But in the townships of Cape Town, Marlin is on a mission to encourage the next generation to understand why they matter. My name is Marlin van Sensi. I'm 21 years old. I come from Capricorn, Cape Town, South Africa. Like many townships in South Africa, Capricorn's residents face pressing issues in their day-to-day -day lives. As a community, we have so much challenges. Poverty, drug and alcohol abuse, gangsterism, that's one of the main influences on the kids today. I feel like we are a forgotten community. His aim is to take the kids away from street violence by encouraging them to connect with the environment. Although Marlin's township is just over a mile from the sea, the combination of poverty and lack of opportunity means local kids haven't been able to experience the kelp forest firsthand. We try to inspire kids through experiencing, firstly, having that connection with the ocean. Marlin introduces kids to the marine environment to teach them about its role in fighting climate change. And through experiencing, 
and having that connection, they would start to fall in love with it. And then once you fall in love with something, you would want to protect it. For the kelp forest, like any environment, the best guardians are always going to be those who live near to it. But often it needs people like Marlin to break down the barriers for that to happen. I think it's important for the kids to learn about kelp. Once you've done a snorkel and you see the kelp forest for yourself, that's when you understand why it's important to protect the kelp forest. By inspiring the next generation, Marlin is working hard to protect a vital carbon sink that will bring benefits to everyone. I felt connected to the sea and everything else. You didn't want to protect the ocean, right? So you're going to go home and tell your friends about it? <laughs> yeah, I'm you tell your... everyone. I just love seeing the smiles on their faces. And seeing the smiles on their faces puts a smile on my face. It just makes me even happier. I don't think any conservation effort will work unless the local people buy into it. It's where they live. It's their present. It's their future. Back in Scotland, I'm going to help Paul's local team of volunteers with a task slightly less dramatic than yesterday's tree clearance, but just as important. Paul said they need plenty of volunteers, so I've brought along my friend, the comedian, writer and director, Simon Amstel. Jack Harris. Simon Amstel. It's a dream. It's an absolute dream. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How good are morning. you? Oh. Simon and I share a passion for taking action on climate change. Like me, he felt inspired to be part of one of Extinction Rebellion's protests in 2019. And he often takes a self-deprecating approach to issues like veganism and climate change in his writing and shows. OK, cool. right, so this was yesterday. Um, OK. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That... Oh, wow, it really... Oh. Quite erotic, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't my first thought when oh I saw it. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'm very turned off. <laughs> but what are we doing today? Yesterday was the tree cutting. Yeah. Today is the even more exciting part, which is the restoration of the bog, a peat bog. Now I don't know what that is. I learned yesterday it's a, a rich, diverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It feels a little bit like a trampoline and this bog is thousands of years old, and they're amazing solutions for climate change. Because they capture the carbon? Yes. This is they, great. They, they sequester carbon. This is great. Over, over millions or thousands of years. They, they suck all the carbon down, and they lock it down, and because of the moisture, because of the sort of, like, type of texture, it keeps it all down there. Well, here's to... Do we cheers? Yeah, here's to today, to yeah. the peat bogs. Yeah, you can do better than that. <laughs> 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 These guys are the real deal. They volunteer here regularly and have a good idea of what they're doing. Simon and I, not so much. So, what we do? We're kind of cutting, <laughs> we're cutting down, down trees. We generate conifers. We re yeah. um, <laughs> and we're quite competitive. We will be recording how many. We pull lop and store, and there might be prizes in it for you guys at the end. Oh. Let's say we have to get at least 400 trees out. Per person? <laughs> no, OK, altogether. collectively. 400 yeah, trees? So... <laughs> well, let's go and chop down some trees, trees to save the earth. Yeah, cool. Would you like to lop or to bow saw? Lop. No, <laughs> no thought about it. <laughs> it's a lopper. OK, great, we're ready. Trees they planted in the 70s. Remember the 70s when well, they thought trees were a good idea? <laughs> These small trees are seedlings from plantations like the one chopped down yesterday. Left alone, they'll destroy the peat bog too. So every one we get rid of helps the peat bog to do its carbon storing job. I picked a really tricky one here. 
It's an interesting technique you got there, Jack. This is, this is not the, the done <laughs> technique. Can I get a lopper over here, please? Simon, I need some lopping assistance. OK, I'm coming. I'm coming. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm here. <laughs> Should we shout timber? Yeah, I think so. Timber! Timber! There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that was go. so smooth. All right. Teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> It feels a bit strange yeah. sawing trees to help them. It, it does, and you know, it's sort of, we're just trying to rectify the wrongs of the past, really. Um, you don't want to bring any heavy machinery up here, it's just going to turn up the, the ground more. So it is labour intensive and it is hard work, but it's the only way we can do it, really. In the long run, it's definitely going to be a benefit to the environment. Mm. So. Do you think it's the same for overpopulation? <laughs> oh, should we, yeah. should we Maybe not with that? the same tools. No, um, no. It's not yeah. funny, that's the problem. That's the, that's the problem, Jack. Yeah, what's the solution? Well, I don't know, you're a twin. There needs to be two of you. <laughs> Get the loppers out. <laughs> Timber! Yay! Yay! Woo! Simon isn't taking this seriously, but I am. What do you and mean? I'm on nine. It'll take another two decades for this area to restore back to natural peatland. It's a long-term commitment from this community of volunteers, and it feels great to have been even a little, or a very little, part of it. So, drum roll. Oh 409! Oh, oh, my goodness! Hey. So, Millie, have you got the little prize? That's great. Um, it's meant a lot to us and Bog, so Aww. we each have a COP26 Speaking Up for Nature badge. How about Thank you so that. much. I've never done anything so wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> After a very damp day in a peat bog, we need a fire and a local whiskey. One might be a lot easier to sort out than the other. That's a good day. Oh, let's go make a fire. Right, where the hell are we going? Ah! And that was the last anyone saw of Jack and Simon <laughs> as they stumbled off into the dunes oh. and the northernmost tip of the UK. Let me say this okay. as a person and a fan. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing here. You know, you're out here all on your own. <laughs> It's difficult, it's right? Me and a fire. Trying yeah. To save the world. Maybe. Do you ever think this is too? Somebody else should be doing this. I'm just. I didn't even finish university. Because <laughs> <laughs> you used to be just like one of those idiot YouTubers, and now you know you're saving the whole bloody world. <laughs> Still an idiot YouTuber. No, no, no. But um, look at you now. You've got all those kids engaging in the climate change, right? That's you true. did that. You did that. Yeah. Or do you think there's a worry maybe they're just sort of touching themselves at home with the sound <laughs> off? <laughs> there is no comedy in the climate space, so there hasn't been. It's often very earnest, very serious. Do you feel you have a responsibility as like a communicator, someone with a platform, to talk about this stuff? Truth is often what's very funny. And the truth is that uh, the planet's on fire, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> No, it's not funny that it's the other fire. It's absurd that we're not like doing something about it like immediately, yeah. or that we weren't doing something about it immediately whenever we were told to do something. Yeah. And so that's funny. How yeah. ridiculous we are. I read the other day we've used up almost all the sand. <laughs> all the sand? <laughs> yes. Not sand now. I thought I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I've been doing this recycling, and someone's used the sand. For me, when I look back at going to all those Extinction Rebellion things, that A, it was a sense of doing something that, that was helpful, but it was also a sense of community. What was it that drove you to, to be, feel moved to go and take part in that? I think I was feeling quite hopeless. What's important, if we are to get out of this thing, is that we all connect, reconnect. The fact is that we're all animals, we're all nature, mm. but we've forgotten this thing. Every individual makes an impact on the planet every day. And you get to choose what sort of impact you make. For me, it's hitting home now more than ever. That to save our beautiful planet, it's not just about reducing emissions from fossil fuels. We have to do all we can to help nature remove the excess carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere after centuries of polluting it. And people are now beginning to understand that we need to work with and not against nature. 
before I leave this inspiring project, I'm catching up with Marlin from Cape Town. Hey, Marlin. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much for being a part of this project. What is it for you that made you fall in love with the ocean? What excites me is it's the colors and the animals. What keeps me motivated to protect the ocean is the animals. I always think it's almost like a whole other world underneath the ocean. It just takes away all your problems. I loved watching the footage and seeing those kids go swimming for the first time and, and experiencing it for themselves. And I guess that's what we have to do with nature and the natural world is we have to make people fall in love with it. And there's nothing more powerful than that. There are so many people doing amazing things and that has honestly filled me with hope on this journey. So uh, I'm really grateful that you're a part of it. And thank you for giving me the opportunity again to share my story. It may not look like much, but one of the things I've learned over the last couple of days is this huge, peaty, boggy expanse of land is one of our best defenses in the fight against climate change. All around the world, there are incredible natural climate solutions. Nature sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and locking it away, doing the job for us. And I have so much respect for the people who are working to protect and to restore these landscapes. My main reason for hope is in the young people. They're changing the world, even as I'm speaking to you. When we say hope, what do we hope? Hope isn't just sitting back, wishful thinking. Hope depends on our action. Hope for the future depends on each one of us doing our bit. Next time, I'm headed to the Isle of Skye with my friend and music entrepreneur, Jamal Edwards, to find out why the impacts of climate change in the Arctic aren't just staying in the Arctic. Whoa! Oh, she sat at the back. <laughs> Hearing from the fastest warming town on our planet. My world is melting. And reconnecting with the climate scientists I first met six years ago in Greenland. Why does it impact us that the ice is melting? If you total it up, the amount of fresh water contained in the Greenland ice sheet, that's over seven metres of global sea level rise. That's London gone. <laughs>